Welcome back to Sci-Fi and Fantasy Read Along. I am ATN. I am Yule. And I'm DM Phil. All right. First things first, I'd like to say thank you to our listeners. Anybody that's been downloading and listening to this podcast, I really appreciate it. I think we all do. I do. See? Yeah, Yule does. It's gratifying to know that what we're doing is um, people are enjoying it. And especially to those of you who have been leaving comments and engaging us in conversations in one way or another. But thank you all. All right, well, let's get caught up. In our last episode, which was Chapter 9, Adjunct Lauren arrived in Pale and confirmed a lot of our suspicions. Many loyalties were tested, and a loquacious Talon and Moss voiced a litany of revelations that could employ a generation of historians. In this episode, Chapter 10, the final chapter of Book 3, entitled The Mission... I'm not going to say anything about what it is about. We're just going to talk about it, right? We are going to save the discussion of the preamble for the section in this chapter when it becomes absolutely relevant. Click. Click. You guys ready? I'm ready. Are you excited? Are you guys prepared? Do you feel prepared? I'm prepared. Ready. All right. Talk to Younger is invited to a mysterious meeting. Talk to Younger is going to the Vimkaros Inn. He's got a meeting he's going to attend. Yes, with an unknown stranger who's told him to dress like a local and attract no attention. That's right. Well, I mean, okay, yeah, that that makes sense. (laughs) So it's like this opulent inn that survived the, what did they call it? The 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 purge or? No, it was the moon rain when all all of the basalt and stuff was falling off moon spawn and crashing into the city. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay, cool. Yeah. It survived that. And yeah, it's, it's this really nice in. Great. Yeah, as he's so, going, they talk about the uh, restructuring of Pale and how they've mm-hmm. taken care of some of the noble people and all that stuff. They killed a couple. <laughs> I think Maybe they a might few have killed, more. <laughs> yeah, they might have killed a couple. <laughs> so yeah, uh, Talk gets seated in this garden or yeah, he's overlooking this garden. And this is where we learn that Tattersail has gone missing and that the fifth, ar- the newly formed fifth army is like occupying all of Dujek's time. So the second army is no more. They're gone. They've been folded into the fifth army. So why is talk here? Really? Who's he here to meet? Uh, he's here to meet Ganos Perrin. What is that? That funny little message that announces Perrin? Like, what is that? Or why is that? What is it? What What is going on? Like, why does some guy walk up to him and say, there is a stranger who's going to approach you who was out out of his depth, but now he knows it. And you're like, huh? <laughs> is that like custom or tradition or something? I don't know. It was just some messenger that showed up. And immediately oh, Perrin shows up right afterwards. Yeah, it was kind of like, I guess it was just like announcing his arrival. Yeah, I mean, that. Uh, yeah. Literally, right? There, there are, so there's that aspect where he says, that's the message, and then the, the messenger says it is. Well, it, he, says, he says that weirdly as well. It, like well the whole thing uh, took me out of the story big time. So Tox says his own words, and then the servant said, and yours, sir. Yeah. That's does what that took make sense me off. to you? No, it that does, does, actually doesn't. No, I don't understand it at all. It doesn't make sense to me. I don't get it. Maybe that's Phil what, has an idea on that one? Yeah, I didn't get that. It seemed like, what was the purpose? He knew he was there to meet somebody he he didn't know. So why give this mysterious introduction for no reason? You can just show up. I'm wondering if it's custom, but I was also wondering if it was just a way for Erickson to give us some information that wouldn't really go well in dialogue. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It was weird. I thought it was weird. Hmm. All right. They meet. One surprised to see the other. One announces that he's been dead recently, but now he's back and he looks healthy. They are both kind of off the rails, aren't they? I mean, neither one of them are behaving in a way that is loyal to the Empire. <laughs> They're both completely operating outside of their authority. Well, even Ganos asked Talk at one moment uh, whether or not he's a claw or a member of the second. I'm trying to suss out whether or not he's going to be betrayed by Talk, basically. Do you remember last chapter? Because I... Perrin does not. I mean, he he was not at that dinner when Talk basically decided his allegiance was to the army and not to the claw. Right, when he didn't rat out Tattersail or anything like that. Yeah. He continued the lie that Tattersail was spinning. He didn't snitch her out. Exactly. He didn't. He could have very easily. He spotted the lie. 
so anyway, they're they're both like sharing information. They're I'm trying to remember just offhand what it was. Like Talk wants to know where Tattersail is, mm-hmm. and Perrin wants to know what the adjunct's plan is, and they just do their little exchange of information. Yeah, it could, you're right. Um, it, there's the whole premise of whether or not the adjunct is actually after Whiskey Jack or if it's just the whole sorry situation. Okay, so Talk is of the opinion that... Probably leaning more towards Whiskey Jack, right? There was more to it than just going after sorry. Mm-hmm. But I think that's all he truly reveals to us. Well, uh, Ganos is like, he can't believe that the, the adjunct would take his kill away from him. or Yeah, his... this is a reward. It was a reward for three years of hard service loyal service exactly he just can't believe it right that it would be all a sham that he was just being used like a pawn he, he has some doubt still he does do you think Perrin is like really that naive uh it does sound like he kind of is um and talk comes right out and says he says the adjunct's mission is like as far as i'm concerned it goes way more than just killing sorry so either talk mm-hmm. knew or talk can just read between the lines and know something else is up Right. I assume he's reading between the lines because he's not specific about what it is, just that he has an inclination that it's more, right? Clearly, um, the adjunct has plans within plans. Right. Do we have any idea what those plans are? Do you, Philip, or do you, Yule, have ideas? Uh, have, having read this chapter, you mean? No, we never jump ahead. We're always just thinking about what's, what's available in front of us right now. She has a past, obviously. Yes, we saw that last chapter. Exactly, but that's really the only thing that has been extracurricular in the way she's working right now that we've seen. I haven't seen anything. That's the answer. I'm, I'm giving like uh, examples of things that could have been in the past, showing us that she does have other motives going on. But as far as the specific whiskey jack and sorry and the 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 bridge burners are concerned, no. The answer is no. Okay. Philip, you got anything? Just to verify what we talked about before, Talk comes out and says that Whiskey Jack is dead meat and the days of the bridge burners are numbered, which is something we had speculated about forever, and he kind of confirms that. Well, I think it was confirmed in last chapter, and we didn't know that he hadn't been able to convince Lorne. We learned that for sure in this chapter, or in this section. He did. He come out and says that he told, basically he told the Empire, don't mess with the Whiskey Jack or you'll have a mutiny. And he's apparently being ignored. This whole meeting really, though, was just to confirm that Tok was going to help Ganos leave the city. Well, not just that. He's at, actually, he recruited Tok and now they're going to be traveling together, trying to find Tattersail or something. I don't think he wanted to recruit Tok. I think that was, that was Tok's idea and it was an accident. It may be fortuitous, but... Do you think Talk is attaching himself so that he can be involved or so that he yeah. can warn Lorne no. in some capacity? I don't think so. I don't think he knows Lorne from Adam. They don't work together. He's the ranking claw in the area. We know that. But he's been avoiding the officers and etc. He doesn't know Lorne. He met her probably for the first time just the other night. And he does force himself on Perrin. He does, and he's not loyal to the Empire. Like he's, this is two, two or three times now. He could just be a double agent. They're both acting as double agents right now. Exactly. So I'm. I just want to keep it in mind as a possibility that sure. he sure. is. He's his just, loyalty is in question. That he's staying in the game just to do his duty in a different direction. Yeah, the double agent scenario. Okay, so let me ask you guys this: since that section's essentially we're done there, you suggested just a second ago, Philip, or you asked the question if Perrin was just that naive. But when you look at what he tells Talk, did you notice that he lies to Talk and he doesn't give Talk very much information? He like holds back a great deal of information that he knows the answer to and that Talk actually wants. We know he wants that information, but he doesn't give it to him. Well, I did notice that, but I just chalked that up to he doesn't fully trust him. I think that's true, but I think he's losing his naivety. I think he's learned the lesson that Topper tried to teach him all those years ago. Do not give out any more information than you have to because information is gold. And present in this section, we see Talk saying that he doesn't want any attention. He wants to go unseen, just like everybody else that has a brain. 
the less notice he made himself, the better. Okay, so there's one last thing about distractions. Perrin claims that Tattersail distracted him, and Talk is like, oh yeah, I remember that dress. <laughs> and I don't want to talk about this at all right now. I just want to put the bug in your ear because I want to talk about it in the next section, I think it is. But Perrin has resolved, after learning what he's learned, that the bridge burners are in danger, and that he already knew Tattersail was on his way to go warn Whiskey Jack. He is resolved now that he's going to leave and go and try to meet up with Tattersail before Lorne catches up to Whiskey Jack. Forced from her warren far out on the Rivy Plain, Tattersail encounters a familiar face. It begins with Tattersail traveling her warren, which, as we know, is like somehow it's a magical shortcut between one place and another. And she's using high fear, but eventually it's getting kind of sick and rotten. So she comes out of it and meets up with Blurden. She said it was being assailed. Yeah. Like the Warren itself was being attacked. I didn't fully comprehend what she meant. Not just that it was getting hard to use, but it was literally getting attacked. It deadened her sorcery is what it says. I kind of imagine it like, you know how you like burn a candle at both ends? She's like in the middle traveling, but she can't get to that end part because it got burned down. Yeah, basically she's on her way to uh, Dirigistan, but she doesn't even get there because she can't use her warrant anymore. It's too difficult. So I just wanted to do a follow-up on one of the things we read about in a previous chapter when they had the social gathering, the big dinner, what do you want to call it? The formal dinner. Yep, last chapter. And she was describing... The fact that she was using wards from the Warren of High Fear, and Tashrin was shocked that she could access that Warren. And we weren't sure whether she was bluffing. At least I was not sure whether or not she was bluffing, because we know she was making up half the story. And it turns out, apparently, she was not bluffing. She can use High Fear, and I don't know what that means either. But point is, at least that part of her story at the formal dinner was, was on the level. Confirmed. Confirmed. She was not bluffing. Okay, so she is using high theater and she's traveling and she can't travel any further. And like you said, she pops out of her warren because it's just exhausting her. And she's like right in front of Bellardin. And Bellardin is kind of shocked to see her. He's like, I expected to find you from a distance, I think is what he expected. There's something missing. There's something missing. I'm trying to remember what it was. It was before she got out. Oh, yeah. That she left so quickly, that part? Yes. Well, the important part there is that she was reminiscing that she had wanted to use the deck of dragons before she left. And then she was distracted by Perrin. Mm -hmm. So they're both this blaming each other for the same distraction. It's a whole he said, she said, oh, I forgot yeah. about this. I would have realized this if this wouldn't have happened. There's an important line there right before she pops out. She said that she had uh, experienced an unaccountable urgency to be on her way. Right. And to me, that means that she was being mentally manipulated oh, yeah. by Opan, right? Almost certainly. I mean, that's, yeah. She was playing a, She was playing around with a tool of Opon. The gods, up until now, they manipulate events to their need, right? But this is the first time we've ever, that I've ever detected, that they were actually manipulating people's minds. Well, how is this really different? Opon absolutely wants to play with these people. Like, wants something. Made her leave in a hurry for a reason. Made her leave her deck of dragons behind. I'm not disagreeing with that. But this, when, you, when you're influencing people's minds directly... You're robbing them of free choice, right? Yes. There's an important distinction between manipulating events and manipulating people's actions. Big difference. And this is the first time I've seen evidence of it, and I think that's that's telling. Okay. Tattersail was distracted. She left everything behind. And her warren's under attack as she's trying to get to Jerujistan. And when she pops out, there's Bellardin. And he's shocked to see her. She's shocked to see him. But she covers it up pretty well, I think. They have a conversation. Immediately, she notices that Bellardin is there, and he's got the sack with Nightchill's body in it, and Nightchill's body has seemingly shrunk, funnily. But she kind of looks past that, and she's trying to distract Bellardin. And how has Tashrin assailed my warren? He's like, he didn't. He just predicted your path. I expected that you wouldn't make it this far. In fact, he even says that Tashrin knew that Tattersail couldn't travel over water because of the high-thier warren. He knows that it's the Talana Masses doing 
he lets her know it wasn't Tayshrin that was assailing the Warren. It's this dead zone around the Talana Moss that's just over there. He said he's like eight hours away, probably by foot. I think he's out there on foot. They're pretty close. I did a rough calculation. It's like 30 miles. At any rate, Blurden tells her that he's there to take her back to Tayshrin. And or, she says, what happens if I what happens if I don't go? And she's like, well, then I'm going to kill you. It's return to Tayshrin or die. Well, it sounds like if she returns to Tayshrin, she's definitely going to die, but it's even more unpleasant. Or worse, she might get her thoughts taken from her. Exactly. At the very least, her brain is going to get scrambled, which was the threat that was keeping Perrin hidden. The one thing I want to point out about Blurden is that he's very literal, and he's, I don't know about honorable to a fault, I think so, but when he says he's going to do something... There is no gray area. I mean, if you say you're going to do it like this, that's exactly what you're going to do, period. He doesn't ask why, ever. And that's the other thing. He never asks why. He just does it. He makes assumptions, but he's very trusting in his assumptions. He always thinks that tayshrin has got the best interest at heart. He thinks that Lacine has the best interest at heart and that Lorne has the best interest at heart. In that brief conversation that you guys are talking about, all of that stuff becomes apparent. He almost seems simple-minded in his inability to interpret things beyond the literal. I see what you're saying there. He has had moments where he, where you said he believes in Lacine, he believes in Lorne. He has made their argument for them saying that the Emperor was crazy, and if he wasn't so, then he wouldn't have got, got the way he did. Look at the example here. The example here is, I will never betray you, Tattersail. The High Mage commands both of us. How can there be betrayal? You know, he's like, we all have to follow this same rule. And just because you don't see it this way anymore isn't the way it is. Which is true. It is true. I mean, <laughs> she is the one that's being seditious. Yeah, you're right. I don't want to say that he's simple-minded. I want to say that he... She does. She does, yeah. Well, he literally has an alien perspective because he's not human, right? No, he's not. My point here is he's not a simpleton. He just has a very different way of, of mentally looking at stuff. And I think that might have to do with his race. Well, Tattersail wants to stall him. She's just come out of her warren. She's, she's exhausted and all these kinds of things. And she starts forcing Bellardin down this path of conversation. Let's talk now. Why don't we talk on the way back? No, let's talk now. And he's like, okay. And this is the honorable thing that Philip was referring to, where he agrees that, yes, he did agree to a conversation in depth. Here, it's going to happen now. He doesn't really argue the point. She wants to know what happened in Jenna Barris. Where's Jenna Barris? Do you guys remember? Far northwest corner of the continent. Yeah, it's where Perrin got off the boat on, on this continent. And he says that the wizards of that city, they were all executed, as she well knows, and among their possessions were some fragments of Gothos Folly, which he was sent to interpret. If you guys recall, back in Chapter 2, Tayshrin mentioned that. He used it as a way of convincing everybody there during that argument that they had in Dujek's tent that he knew what was up and the plan was all right. But we find out here, what do we find out that they actually learned from those fragments here? Because Bellardin is not a liar. Tayshrin is a liar. He's a manipulator. Bellardin is straight and narrow. Yes, he's almost incapable of lying. He may be incapable of lying. So he talked about finding a burial place of a Jagat tyrant. Is that right? Yeah. But it was not a burial place. It was a prison. And he also reveals then that his race, the Thelemen, are distantly related to the Jagat, which is what Philip was referring to a moment ago about not being human. This giant is descended from even gianter giants, the Jagat. But Tattersail's response is, they don't have a government, so how can there be a tyrant? He did say that some of them, for whatever reason, they have a desire to rule over others. He specifically said that occasionally one's blood is poisoned by ambition. Quick question, going back a couple chapters to Darujistan. Do you remember when Baruch and Crone were awaiting the arrival of Turban Orr? Yes. Do you remember what Crone said about Turban Orr? Yes. He wears something on his shoulder called ambition or something. 
She referred to it as a demon perched on his shoulder. Is that foreshadowing or is that just coincidence? Suspicion. I don't know. I noticed it. That's all. I'm just pointing it out. Fair enough. I remember. That was actually a very interesting way to describe Turbinor's personality and character. And I didn't give much thought other than it was a beautiful description. So here, different type of description. Same problem, though, apparently. All of these revelations about what was discovered in the tyrant, Tattersail ha draws some conclusions based on this information. What does she conclude? That Lorne's true purpose is to unleash this jagged tyrant or kill him or something. Awaken it? That's the word, Yule. Let's go back to, I think it was the very beginning of Chapter 7 when Krupp had his second dream and he met Kroll in his dream. And Kroll was kneeling in a funeral pyre. And when he left Krupp, he said over his shoulder, seek the Talanu Mass who leads the woman. They are the Awakeners. Ah. The location of the prison burial site of the Jagut Tyrant is in the Gadrobi Hills just to the east of Daruzhistan. And so now Tattersail is convinced that they're on their way to release this Jagut Tyrant. I have no idea why. I can't conceive of it. Like, I thought about it and I was like, huh? Unless they can control it, I don't see why they would want to let it go. I don't see any reason whatsoever, but that's what she thinks. And she says something about the auditorial sword. How would the auditorial sword come into play here, do you think? I don't know, other than the Jagat were very magical and the auditorial eats magic. Oh, maybe it's to destroy the wards around him or something. That's kind of what I was thinking, because I think it basically absorbs it. Like it may, It's like a, uh, an antenna for magic. It just... No, it just absorbs it and nothing happens. So maybe they're going to use the sword to release him? I don't, I don't understand her logic. She doesn't explain. She just says, that auditorial sword. They're going to release the tyrant. And then Bellardin is like, no, they're probably preventing someone else from releasing the tyrant. That is the truth. He draws that conclusion based on that's the reasonable thing to do. So obviously it's true, right? But he's wrong. He was wrong about Tatrin, and I think he's wrong here. Well, do you remember when Lauren said that the auditorial sword does not work against Talani Moss? Mm hmm So why would it work against the Jagat? That's a good question. It's not the same. It isn't the same, but it's Elder. So what happens at the end of this? When the conversation's over, you gotta go back to Pale. At the end of this section, Tattersail is more resolved than ever that she needs to get to Darujistan and to Whiskey Jack before... Well, does she resolve to go after Lorne? She says she has to get to Darujistan. Well, I thought she was going to hook up with Whiskey Jack, is what I thought. Well, she said she must go on. Okay, well, I don't know why she's going. I thought it was to go see Whiskey Jack. I think it is, to warn him that Lorne is after him. So, do you remember when it said Nightchill's body in the sack had seemed to have shrunken? There's more there than just the body was getting smaller, right? Because the body wouldn't get smaller. The bones would still be the same. So, somehow, Nightchill's body itself has gotten smaller... Uh, the reason I'm asking this is because it says that if she used any of her warrens, it would destroy her, consume her. She found a way out, and I don't comprehend how. We actually skipped over that part in the very, very beginning. And so let's talk about that right now. Okay. When Tattersail is stalling Bellardin and she's like asking him questions so that she can recover some strength and her wherewithal, it is revealed that the Talana Moss is creating that dead space around them. Yeah. And that that was what was assailing her Warren. And the more she opens her Warren, it's a positive feedback, right? The more she opens her Warren, the more the dead zone consumes it. So that if she opened it completely, it would consume her entirely. Right, but when she looked at the bag of Nightshield, she still saw the faint glimmer of sorcery. She said there's a connection there. That might be a way out. It was a preserving spell that she cast. She referred to it two different ways. She referred to it as a spell of preservation and a spell of, oh man, I don't even think I wrote it down. Sealing. I don't know, but she made this leap of logic there and I, I can't follow it. That's good. That actually leads into a question I had for you. First of all, do you think she's acting out of character? But we haven't seen enough of her to really know. She seems quiet. She seems compassionate. She seems like a giver. And now she's willing to kill her own friend to keep going. Is that right? He's going to kill her. That's that's the truth. It's kind of self-defense. But okay. So she is out there without her deck of dragons, right? She left on a dime. Her urgency was unnatural. And we have already speculated that this seems like it might have been Opon's doing, right? You're telling me that her response to Bellardin at the end of this part is uh -huh. Opon doing this to her? 
Would you like to know why I think that? Yeah, go ahead. She's out there without her deck of dragons. The deck of dragons is a it's a form of divination, correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So whatever it was, cut her from her deck of dragons, will not let her divine the future, wants her on her own with no tools, like only her wits about her, puts her out there in front of Bellardin, exactly the right time, exactly the right place. So that sense of urgency was intended to get her here. That was lucky. Lucky. Yeah, right. <laughs> now that she's here, she notices that there's that gleam of magic on the burlap sack with Nightchill's body in it. She thinks to herself, well, maybe that's a way out. To me, I, well, the way that I read that is that she is taking a huge chance. She knows it's death either way. Mm -hmm. She's in this space, in this time, and she's forced to rely on a long shot. Right. Now, is that taking advantage of the thing that Opon has laid in front of her? Or is that being fueled by Opon to do this thing? Ultimately, Tatter sails like, this guy is going to kill me if I don't go with him. Or he's going to take me into a situation I can't be in. So I'm going to take this out. And what does she do? She opens her warren. All the way open. And Bellardin charges her and she embraces him. That's the way it ends. I don't get it, but it said it just blackened the world around her. So it leaves you thinking that she was completely consumed and destroyed and died. And Bellardin also. Yes. Crispy. We have to assume, right? She was thrown between a rock and a hard place. She was put out there, and it's almost undeniable that she was put out there with the assistance of Opon's meddling. And then when forced into the situation, I don't know that she had much choice, but it is, it is a long shot. She sees something that we don't see. She sees an opportunity, a possibility that we don't see, and she, t she takes the gamble. Not far to the east, Adjunct Lorne and Tool observe a fountain of fire splitting the night sky. Uh, well, like you said, it's just Lorne and Tool, or Olas Tulan. Onos. Oh, Onos Tulan. Uh, Tool, that's a good way to say it. <laughs> they observe the scene that we just left when Tattersail burnt herself and Bellardin up in the, you know, the night sky. A fountain of fire rising above the horizon. Yeah, splitting the night sky and lasting for over an hour. Yeah, yeah. and they're like 30 miles away, right? Or something like that? Approximately. Bellardin said that they were eight hours away from Lorne. Tool says that the fountain was within the barrier that he had cast around them. So yeah. I guess a protective spell, if you will. That's how close it still is. Or how far his power is. Yeah, that dead zone was what caused Tattersail to come out of her warren. Within line of sight, I mean, they can see this pillar. Massive, burning pillar of fire and light. Lauren said that she's never seen anything like it. She asked him if he recognized the warren. And he said, warrens, multiple. And he listed it off like a whole bunch. And he said, Talan, Thier, Denul, Driss, Tennis, or Tens, I'm not sure how to say it. Uh, Teleman, Toblakai, Starvold, Demolane. She's she hadn't even heard of that one. So that's the first time we've ever come across it, and it's apparently it's like Elder or something like that. You are keeping track of these things, as far as I'm aware, correct? I am. How many of those Warrens were you already aware of? I was only aware of uh, Talen, Thier, and Denul. What are they? I don't remember. I don't have it up right now. I could look it up, but I don't have it up right now. Okay. Well, nevertheless, we're only familiar with a couple of them. And then Teleman, Toblakai, that's obviously the giant one. These were all opened up by Tattersail, right? Unknown. Probably. <laughs> Something happened out there. Something's going on out there. We don't know what happened. All we know is the result that is manifest was this huge column of light on the plane. That's all we know. It seems like Tattersail opened her warren, and this is what this is what happened. But if you think about it, some of this stuff makes sense, right? Um, fear that makes sense. That's that's the warren that caused this whole thing to go off. And that's hers. Uh, Thelam and Toblakai. There's there's old um, Belurden. Belurden. That's probably his warden warren. If if I were to guess, I would say that was his warren. The, well, the healing. Denuel might be on the uh, the preservation word. Yeah, on, maybe. On the body. Maybe. maybe. I'm just saying. Maybe. There's a lot going on here. There's a, And Starvald Demolane? What? 
immediately after that, he, they start talking about what that is. And he said, it's an Elder Warren. And she says, well, I thought there were only three. And he's like, no, there's many. That's the one that they all come from. But the point is, she asked, who could manage such a conjuring? And he said, there was one once. But of worshipers, there are none left. So he is no more. And I think he's referring to Cruel, right? I think that's a logical assessment, yes. Cruel said he was ancient before anything else, and there were like maybe even the most ancient gods still living. I don't know. What he said specifically was that he walked the earth among hunters. Yes, I remember. But the point is, I, I, I kind of have a theory here that the person who made all that happen might have been Cruel somehow. I'm on the same page with you. I think it's Cruel also. I think we have been given stuff in previous chapters that suggest that that is the most logical case. Then he says something was born during that conjuring. He said whoever con- whoever conjured it was destroyed, but then there was a new presence, and Tool sensed it. The rumble reached them, and then it was gone. Tool said it was destroyed. The source. The source is destroyed. So the source wasn't cruel then. No, the source was Tattersail. Yeah, exactly. So I don't think Cruel had anything to do with this. You don't think so? Well, I don't know. <laughs> I just want to go against you. He said something new was created, and he said it, it was fleeing. I don't know what fleeing means, like literally physically running away, or fleeing in a warren, or... Going in the other direction as fast as it can. Yeah, we don't know, and we won't find out for a couple pages. So after the lights go out, it's darkness again. Darkness has descended. Something's been born on the plane. It might have been a conjuring. It's unfamiliar to anybody present. We know that it's very likely that that was Tattersail and Bellard and going up in a puff of smoke. But was she put there? Was she caused to be there? Was Kroll involved? Was Opon involved? All of these things are possible. Remember, we don't know who brought Kroll back. When they had the dream, Cruel said that somebody had spilled blood on his altar, which kind of like... He said that it wasn't enough to summon him. Huh. And yet here he was. But nevertheless, we're, we're left with a lot more questions and answers right now. And fair I enough. think that's fair. That's fine. That's okay. But the light's gone out. Darkness has descended. And Lorne notices that a storm is forming on the western horizon. And with the absence of light, she realizes that she has an unnatural fear of the dark. Suddenly. Has she been afraid of the dark before now? Haven't seen it. Doesn't strike me as the type, right? Out of instinct, she walks close to Tool and she says to him, fire is life. Life is fire. He said, with such words was born the first empire, the empire of Amas, the empire of humanity. And then he says, you've done well, my child. I just have, like, WTF on here because I did not get it. And I think you picked it up, Atian. I certainly noticed it. That whole section is very, very strange. So when she's realizing that she's afraid of the dark, she's looking at him and she's watching the firelight from their campfire playing over his armor, his helmet, I think it is, and his, like, dead flesh. And something comes up out of instinct, primordial in her mind, And that's when she says life fire is life. And that's how he responded. But that whole, like you have done well, my child, what is that? Exactly. She she learned she's accepted something. Has Has, she, is there a lesson there? I mean, why would he call her my child? What did he just reveal? It's either literal as in he is old. He is wise. And just like a priest, he refers to, Everybody younger than him as his children or his flock or whatever the case may be. But Which we haven't I seen that I don't believe yet. that. That's a possibility, but I don't believe it. I think if that was where our minds were supposed to go, Erickson would have already used it before. You know what I mean? He would have given us an inclination that he says stuff like that. He doesn't say stuff like that yet. Yes. At no point in there has he ever been paternal or patronizing in that regard. This is the first time we've ever seen that. Is there a passage somewhere in this book where someone has said fire is life, life is fire, and then there was more to that? Because should there have been, maybe the you've done well, my child, is just the end of that. Okay, I mean, I see what you're saying, but I don't I don't know. I don't remember seeing this before. Me I don't recall it. Okay, so the thing that he has revealed just now is that the Talana Mas are ancestors of humans. And whether we knew that already, did we know that already? 
No. So were they really the first empire? The Talana Moss, were they the first empire? I doubt it. But this is what he says. All she said is that fire is life. And you have done well, child. Like, to what? To recognize that fact? He's pretty cryptic. I don't. I have no idea what's going on here, but I don't think it's what we're seeing on the board. Something, something else is going on. Well, th- there may be some sort of weird psychic connection here because remember, she she muttered that phrase, which kind of came out of nowhere. Yeah, almost like possession. It's something, and then he responded as if the words prompted him to respond that way. As you know, uh, you know when somebody gives like half a of a mantra and the other person automatically gives the other half. Do you know what I mean? My question then is this: Are they not just talking about that column of fire? Because they were just talking about something that escaped it and ran away. And then her very next thing she says is fire is life. And then he says life is fire. You know, Lauren had that unreasoned fear of darkness which suddenly came over here. That is another example of some sort of mind-affecting power or or circumstance. I don't know. It's not explained, but this is the second time I've noticed it, right? More questions and answers just something to pay attention to for the future because I expect that we're going to in a future chapter go aha maybe not even this book (laughs) that sucks early morning far to the north crone descends into the encampment of Caladan brood yeah this is on the rivy plain and crone if you don't remember is that great raven of Anamanda rakes I guess Although she's talked about serving another master before, and here we are with Caladan Brood, who it seems is that master. Yeah, she lands in the encampment, which is basically unguarded, and goes straight to the command tent. Caladan Brood is back to the entrance, unconcerned with her arrival, looking down at a battle map. But let's describe Caladan Brood. What do you think? One man stood alone, his back to the doorway. An enormous iron hammer was slung across his broad back. Despite its size and evident weight, it looked almost toy-like against the span of muscle and bone. Power rolled from him in musky waves. If you guys will recall, Crone can see magic quite clearly, and just before this description, she describes one of the Warrens that we encountered out on the plane to the south just a little while ago, Driss. And it's it's apparently his Warren, and it's the Warren of Earth Magic. So he's she sees him as radiating turgid magenta. We've been hearing about Caladan Brood since almost the very beginning of the book, and all we know about him is that he's leading the armies of the north against the Empire, and he's wiping up the floor with them, right? Yep. At one point, they said he was human, and then later on, they said he was half-human. That was in that poem about him, right? Yes, you're correct. I mean, yes. there's been poems written about this dude. Yeah, I just I just read the poem earlier that Tattersail quoted. I think they were right. all quoting it. All of the wizards were quoting it in turn. Because they they're all familiar with it. They were and, remembering it as it was going along. They're like, oh, yeah, and then this part, too. And then they came up with the name. Yeah. But then they came up with Anna Amanda Rake's name. So it kind of made us feel that Caladan Brood was actually a little bit below him. It is suspected that he has Bargast blood. Something. Either way, it's clear that he's not a normal human, right? He's definitely special. Seems like a pretty badass dude. (laughs) Just the description with that hammer, you know, and like the waves of power rolling off of him and how big he is and that giant hammer that looks like a kitty toy on his back. I mean, it's pretty cool. They did bring up something else about his personality, which I find enjoyable. So who knows how old this guy is or how long he's lasted or what his capabilities are. But he said there's a small hanging at the far end behind which squatted an army cot. And that's it, right? Yeah, that's his room. That's where he sleeps. I mean, no no, no fancy, no luxuries, just mm-hmm. absolute pure military efficiency. I love it. I do too. I agree with you. And um, the thing that I really liked about him was something that Crone said a little bit later on. She says that he, uh, she's like, oh, Caladan Brood, always looking for the bloodless path. So here's here's a guy who is powerful, leading an army, and like he's going out of his way to try to not kill people. Well, if you remember, the gold Moranth did not want to fight him. And it wasn't yeah. because they were afraid. It's because they considered him too honorable to consider him a foe. Isn't that amazing, though? 
All right, let's get into this section. We've played D&D, so we're all familiar with battle mats. He just basically has this huge table that is the terrain that his armies are arrayed on, and Crone jumps up on the table and starts looking at where everything is and starts criticizing and she's scrutinizing is the word I think she uses. She's scrutinizing his armies and she starts asking him questions and pointing things out and making comments about his strategies and etc. And she's obviously pretty well versed in all of these things. There's some information about, um, what's his name? Jorik? Is that right? Yes. Jorik is a Crimson Guard commander who has been put in charge of Bargast tribes, and he they have claimed him as one of their own. They call him Sharp Lance. And some of Crone's early criticism is of the fact that this guy, Jorik Sharp Lance, his army has disintegrated on the battlefield. And Caladan Brood corrects her and says that it was all kind of a feint, and he destroyed two whole large groups of gold moranth by pretending to be wounded and then outflanking them. And now they're bogged down in the, for the gold Morant are bogged down in a forest. So there's a reason why I mentioned that now. Um, but Crone continues her observations and Caldan Brew gets a little tired of it. He's like, what are you here for? The coin bearer is known to me. Well, not only is she just so freely giving it up to Caladan Brood, but how she was able to, she calls him master. She does. And it, you know, we had all those chapters ago when she got that little information. It just seemed like everything she was doing was there to help Baruch, right? It was it yeah. Baruch? Yeah. Philip was correct all that time. What ago, did he say then? He a long time ago when when we were talking about that particular chapter, Philip said that Crone had stayed behind not just to offer assistance, but to learn things and to like gather information. She was there in order to sort of spy. And now we're For finding Kalanat out. Brood. <laughs> I tip my hat to you, Philip. <laughs> uh, that was a lucky guess, maybe at best. It doesn't matter. We're I mean, it's like you had the feeling, right? You had that intuition. Here's my intuition. Again, itching uh, in the back of my mind is that she's calling Brood Master. She also calls Anamanda Rake Master. Well, the truth is, I think she is just a master spy who likes knowing what's going on. I think that's a pretty astute observation. I don't believe she really feels like any of these guys are her master. Okay, let's come back to that at the end because there's something very interesting that happens in another section that I think supplies evidence to what you just said. Okay. So she's delivering this information that the coin bearer is known to them. And we find out that Opon's MO for expanding their sphere of influence is to land the coin into somebody's hand that is associated with other people who are then exposed to the influence of Opon because of their association. So Opon is able to reach tendrils into realms that they normally couldn't affect because the coin bearer is associated with other people. That's their influence. That's how they, that's how they reach their influence. And we find out during this kind of revelation that Anamander Rake cannot stand Opon. They, they talk back and forth a little bit about Rake and like, how he's disdainful of the people below him, and like he's a fool. Uh, Caladan Brood calls him a fool, essentially. So, do you guys do you understand what happened there? Like what that was about? Uh, only that it's an old enmity. I, I don't get it. There is an old enmity there. Yes, absolutely. And Crone says that Rake is really good at killing, and that if he got the opportunity, he would spit both the Lord and the Lady on his sword. And that is when Brood says that he's a fool. It has to do with, he says that Opon is the only power challenging Rake in the area. And Rake doesn't even know that Opon is there. This is just a case of power attracts power. There's no one to oppose Rake powerfully except Opon. So if Rake killed Opon, I think if I'm getting this correct, there would be a power vacuum. And in that vacuum, the only other players on the board that can match his power would be forced to do so, which would cause Lacine to enter the fray, and that, they think, would destroy Darugistan. That is my interpretation of what I read there. I am open to suggestions to the contrary. 
but I'm I feel pretty good about it. No argument. I thought Opon's hard on was against uh, Cotillion and the rope and all that stuff. Like they're not mad at Rake. They're not trying to do anything against Animander Rake. There was nothing said about Opon having animosity towards Rake. It That's was the other saying. way around. Okay. Rake doesn't like Opon. I don't and think anybody likes Opon. Like anybody that's a planner, like Tattersail, she's a planner, right? She likes to have as much information as she can. Anybody that is like that is going to be really, really put off by Opon because Opon destroys plans. No plan survives Opon. That's what Baruch said. Well, like you, I think I think you nailed it because these are guys that make their their lives and their futures and, and and their plans are built upon like very careful setting of events. And Opon just kind of like throws every single plan up up in the air, and you don't know how it's going to land, right? Yeah, I, th- I think that's pretty fair. While all this is going on, Crone is inadvertently destroying the layout of the armies on the map. And Caladan Brood says that Rake is unaware of the people beneath him. And that disdain, it might just be disdain. I don't remember if it's unaware. But he says that because of how he treats the people beneath him, like they've landed on their faces a few times. And Crone is doing exactly that. She's like literally disturbing the armies below her. And he's like, stop it. (laughs) (laughs) You're messing up my armies. My toys. You know she's doing it on purpose. You touching my toys. Stop it. Yeah, yeah. I think so, yeah. But it like it's kind of parallel what they're talking about. And Rake has recalled his mages. And remember, he's unaware of Upon. As far as they know. Like he's unaware. So why would he recall his mages? Let's not be hasty on saying he doesn't know, because do you remember when the I guess the the Tisti Andy went into Darugistan for the first time and they were fighting on this on the on the rooftops? Well, those those Tisti Andy were convinced Opon was there. <laughs> right. Somebody with a sense of humor. Had yeah. Been well, playing with them. Yeah, exactly. I think they knew Opon was there because somebody was just a little bit too lucky. They they did know it was an ascendant, but I suspect that they knew it was Opon, right? Okay, let me clarify. When Crone reveals that the coin is in play and that she knows who has it, Caladan Brood asks, what does Rake know? And she says, of this little, but you know well his dislike of Opon. Oh, fair enough. I don't know exactly what he knows, but Crone seems to think he doesn't know a lot about the coin being in play in Darugistan. What I read out of that is that Rake probably knows Opon is on the board, but he does not know that the coin is involved or there is a coin bear. I think Crone kept that from him. Okay, so there's some stuff in there about the mages, though. He's recalled his mages. I mean, I think that kind of makes sense, right? Uh, Moonspawn just took a big hit, and he's not there to protect that city anymore, and it's mostly peopled with children. So maybe he recalled his sorcerers for that. I don't really know, but it sounded to me like Caladan Brood assumed that he was going to use his sorcerers to go after the coin bearer, even though he's not really that aware of the coin bearer, because he's asking who could challenge Animander Rake's sorcerers. Yeah, you said it, it's like, because Brood says the coin bearer needs protection now that Rake's recalled his mages. So those two facts are connected, right? So does that mean that he's sending his wizards after the coin bearer? I think that's what it implies, yes. So then how does he know little of the situation? That's the thing I don't understand. Okay, so there's, something's not congruent right there, but... I read it pretty deeply. I read it carefully. I thought about it. I don't really understand. But it sounds like Rake is going to go after Opon. Not necessarily the coin bearer. I don't know. Maybe he just intends to go after Opon and he doesn't want the coin bearer to, to get squashed. Whether or not Rake even knows that he there is a coin bearer. Right. But right now we know that there are several people who want to protect the coin bearer. Let's talk about that, yeah? I don't get that. So you know there's a coin bearer. To me, if you remove the coin bearer, then you're 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 hurting Opon, right? Because Opon has a plan. But yeah, if, okay. If this may be one of those things where you're either watching the coin bearer is because you want to know how what Opon's intentions are, or two, it's if you mess with the coin bearer, Opon is going to completely screw you over. Or three, it may not be possible to harm the coin bearer. Oh, it's got to be possible because everybody wants to protect the coin bearer. Oh, okay. true enough. True Do you enough. remember Baruch? He set all of his agents 
to protect. That's their only job. He's like, pull everybody out of retirement. They're all to protect the coin bearer. And now here we have Caladan Brood, and he's like, I need some powerful wizards to protect the coin bearer. Do you think that people want to protect the coin bearer because it's better to be Opon's friend and helper than not be his friend and helper? I I don't see Opon as actually pl- like giving credit for anybody for helping him. Well, you say him, but I think we're dealing with the lady. Uh, okay, or them. I think right now we're dealing mostly with her plans, and I don't know, though. I mean, I just don't know. It, to, to me, it's kind of mind-boggling, but again, this might be just a situation where we're faced with a lot of information that we can't put together yet because we can't see the whole picture. Suffice to say, every player wants to protect the coin bearer for some reason. I don't get it, but that's what they're doing. The coin's in play. Maybe Opon's involved in all that. What's the alternative? Well, like I said, just remove the coin bearer from the board, and whatever plans Opon has in play, you've got to be hurting those plans, right? Didn't we talk about whether or not, like, if that were to happen, then the coin would go somewhere else? And that makes things even more difficult to suss out. In our pre-meeting, we had suggested the idea that oh, it's kind of right. like the devil that you know, right? If you know yeah. where the coin bearer is and you know who's got the coin, like keep your eye on that person, keep them alive, because then at least you know what Opon's up to. I think like simply that could easily just be that. <laughs> it could. It could. I hope that's the explanation because that does make some sense. You know, right. It's entirely possible that we're getting too paranoid about Erickson's complex plans. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he's given us reason to be paranoid. Let's introduce Kalor, okay? Because all of this discussion has happened, and then eventually Brood is like, get out of here, bird. But on your way south, keep your eye on the Rivy Plain, because something's going on out there. And she's like, okay, well, if he's worried about it, I should be too. And she takes off. And then he stares at the map, and a half an hour later, he's like, Kalor, to me! (laughs) I don't know how he talks. He has a real high voice. A Caledon brood. That's the only. That's why he doesn't get the respect he deserves. <laughs> that's why he sleeps on a cot by himself, right? That's right. All right. So let's talk about the preamble. Let's talk about the preamble now, All knowing right, full well that we skipped it in the beginning. Uh, we meant to for this very reason. Yeah, exactly. We sure did. Right. Now it's pertinent. Um, it is pertinent. All right. So let's talk about the preamble. All right. So first of all, this comes from Conversations of War. Second Command, Kalor, speaking with Warlord Kaladin Brood, recorded by Outrider, her local 6th Army. It starts off with Kalor speaking and then Kaladin Brood responding. And Kalor said, It's like, I walked this land when the Talani Mas were but children. I have commanded armies a hundred thousand strong. I have spread the fire of my wrath across entire continents and sat alone upon tall thrones. Do you grasp the meaning of this? And Caledon Brune says, yes, you never learn. <laughs> uh, funny. I don't know. I like that. It was hilarious because this guy is like hundreds of thousands of years old. And he gets up and he talks all tough. Like he's the most amazing, most incredible person in the world. And Caledon Brew just knocks him down. Okay, so Calor, why is he calling Calor? What do you mean? Why did he want this guy? Why did he just say, hey, you, to me? So he's getting a an update on what's been going on, basically. Well, he wants to leave. He's like, I'm leaving. I have to go talk to Prince Kaz in person. You're right. in charge. And he's oh, like, yeah. oh, yeah. He's, he's like, don't get so excited. People, people will think that you're more into this than you let on. What I kind of don't get is Kalor is supposed to be this really awesome guy with a lot of history. And he's controlled huge empires. And he's laid waste to continents or whatever he's done. And so now he's working for Kellett and Brood. Mm-hmm. I don't get it. Why? What's not to get? I just don't get it. I mean, if he's so amazing, why is he, I guess, sub, not subservient is not right word, but certainly um, under the com- uh, under the command of Kellett and Brood. Maybe Kellett and Brood is more awesome than him. Uh, exactly, right? Exactly. But he's also very humble, right? Kellett and Brood seems to be, yeah. Uh, Kalor obviously is not. No, Kalor is just full of himself. I get the sense of ennui from this guy. You know, he's just kind of like been there, done that, bored. Like, he doesn't see the point maybe. I don't know. But it's it's in they're in opposition in a sense, right? You see this 
preamble where he claims that he's done all of these amazing things and then he's he's second in command to brood well uh we we made mention about how uh crone said oh caladan brood you don't want to you know you don't want to shed any blood mm-hmm. you know he sounds like he's the kind of guy that if he can you know take over something without killing everybody that'd probably be the best way to go sure So in the beginning where he's like, you never learned anything is like, you've done all these things that are so monumental and momentous, you know, and all this other stuff. And it just shows him that he never learned, you know, the, the best way to kind of like, don't, don't pay attention to me. (laughs) Kind of what it sort of sounds like also. Yeah. I just made this connection in my mind that I hadn't made before. Was it because Yule told you? No. It just came up. Oh, okay. No, something different. Something different. Go. So, you know how Kaladin Brood is this awesome warlord, right? Yes. Have you guys ever read Sun Tzu, The Art of War? No. There's a lot of lessons in there. And one of the lessons is the perfect battle is one where nobody dies and you still win. Right. Right? That doesn't sound like a lesson so much as a... Uh, well, it's the goal. Yeah. And you said the perf- it's like the perfect battle battle is the one you win without killing anybody but it also says every battle it's like every battle is either won or lost before you meet the enemy so i i i'm seeing connections with the art of war in caladan brood i mean we already know he's a warlord right but I, it's like steven erickson has also read sun tzu and he's putting those little tidbits in there as part of his character sure it's i wouldn't like, be surprised he strives to be the perfect warlord and warlord doesn't mean you kill everybody. Warlord means you always win at war. Right. Right. So, just just a connection I think I made. Uh, there's some homage in there to, to Sun Tzu. All right, good. Thank you. The interaction between Kalor and Brood, they talk about Jorik Sharplance and how it was more likely that he won because of Lady Luck than anything else. But um, Brood is leaving because he wants to talk to Kaz, as we mentioned. And he wants these wizards. Well, he also, well is that the Sixth Blade? Yes. Kalor tells Kaladin and Brood to destroy and kill Anamanda Rake. Yes, he does. And he said, you will rule dismissing my advice. And he said, Con- consider that my last warning. And that sounds like foreshadowing big time. Did it sound to you like he was saying that within earshot of Kaladin and Brood? No, he had already been gone. It seemed like he was saying it under his breath to me. Not not that it matters, but like that's how I kind of took it. it was well, maybe not. Brood was not supposed to hear that, but apparently Kalor had already given him that advice. Get rid of this guy, he's trouble. Yeah. And that, I think that was the context of, of him saying it that way, is that he had, he had previously told or advised Brood to, to kill or destroy Anamanda Rake. So does that suggest to you anything as far as, like, Kalor's loyalty? Like, you will rue this day if you don't do this thing that I've recommended. Uh, and this like is the he's last against time. both Rake and Kaladan Brood, ultimately. Well, it sounds like to me that he's, you know, if he has to take it into his own hands to destroy Anamander Rake, he's willing. Right. Right. Is there something between Kaladan Brood and, and uh, Anamander Rake that we don't know? Kaladan Brood instructed Crone to keep... Anamander Rake in the dark about certain things. Of like, course, don't mention this to Rake. Of course, Caladan Brood, Crone is in her head, says, I'm not getting anything from you either. <laughs> I get less from Anamander Rake than I actually do from Caladan Brood. <laughs> right. It makes spying so much easier. Get some info. It seems like there's more tension between Anamander Rake than Caladan Brood than I had previously thought. Like, that's not a black and white relationship where they're allies and everything is hunky-dory, right? They're obviously not on... They're, they're allied, but it's not necessarily a smooth alliance. And I think the same thing is true with Kalor as well and Brood. Fair but, enough. I mean, how old is that guy? He's more than 300,000 years old. Yes. Right? He's older than the Talana Moss, so he's ancient, and he's just this dude walking around, swinging his hips, like talking a big talk. <laughs> he doesn't learn. Back in the south, 
Talk the Younger and Gano's Perrin discover the source of last night's Pillar of Fire. So Perrin and Talk have been crossing the Rivie Plain for some time, and they had obviously seen this huge Pillar of Fire in the distance, and they finally get to that location, and they find this huge blackened area, and they go to investigate it. So there's this like charred tree stump looking thing in the middle of an unburned area that's like five meters in diameter or something like that. And then everything around it's charred, burned. And that tree, what, what is that? That's not a tree. Bellerton. Bellerton. So he says that the bodies are unrecognizable, but he knows that it's Tattersail and Bellerton. He knows yeah. there's two bodies there. I don't know how, but... Gannis is off the horse in the sand, and he's, like, upset. Tears streaming, right. pulling his hair out. Yeah, what a all baby. That. All right, so, sure. Let's say he's being a baby right now, but what is... what? Perrin is on his knees freaking out about all of this stuff, which to me seems quite out of character. And then you've got Talk, who's remained in the saddle pulled out his bow, knocked an arrow, and then approached. And he has noted the burlap sack lying in the grass. And he says this burlap sack is torn and something has walked that way to the northeast out of this bag. It's small-footed and what bony feet is what it was. No flesh on the feet. Yeah. Walking away. So we had talked earlier about the shrinking of Nightshill's body. Yeah. And it sounds like she shrank down to the size of a child or so. And got up and walked away. Yes, yeah, so now I'm confused because they're describing this rotting body, or has rotted, but I thought uh, Tattersail put a spell of preservation on it? She did. Rotting body or a reassembling body, maybe? I don't know. The point is, it was bony. Well, I mean, you gotta start from somewhere, right? Back in chapter two or three, it had already begun to decay and stink. Which That's is true. why Tattersail put the sealing spell on the body. Oh, is it but, only because of Nightshill that that body was stinking? Or was it the unbathed Bellardin who was probably exuding some crazy magic also? Both. I don't know. I, I was under the impression it was just the bag, okay. man. I'm, I just don't know. Yeah. It's a dead woman in a burlap sack. It probably stinks. Yeah, yeah quickly. <laughs> and a lot. And remember, she was not a whole body. Mm -hmm. She was torn apart by a demon, literally limb from limb. She was torn into pieces. So she has shrunk and reassembled in the, in the meantime. Right. Whether decaying is continuing or not. Okay. So Bellardin was out on the plane looking for a proper burial site for night chill when Tattersail showed up and he's like, well, <laughs> I was busy. Leave me alone. And in, in the interim, that body shrank. So it might have been something that Tattersail had done, but it was certainly not something that Bellardin commented on to us, right? The other part of that coin is somehow Tashirin contacted Bellardin and said, we want you to get Tattersail. Yeah, that, I think that's exactly what happened. He was out on the plane and Tashirin contacted him and said, you know, when you find her, bring her back to me. Like interrupting what you're doing, if necessary, because this is important. This is just a weird theory. So... Tattersail had cast a spell of preservation on Nightchill. The Talani Mass had created this radius of influence that essentially consumed or deteriorated magic, right? If Tattersail's magic had been com had completely infused the tissues of Nightchill for the purposes of preservation, as the Talani Mass's magic was consuming fear magic, do you think it could have made it shrink? It seems a little fast for her body to have shrunk based on the influence of the Talana Moss. The body shrank. We have no idea why. Let's just move on. Yeah, I think that's that's pretty much it. You nailed it. Good job. All right. So um, Perrin is freaking out, as we've mentioned. And he's like, Tattersail was right. Otherwise, they wouldn't have killed her. All right. What was she right about? That they're going after Whiskey Jack. Is that it? I don't know. I think. I think that, I mean, that's all I can think of. 
Well, it kind of cements in his mind what he's been hearing anyway. That you know, and he has it in for Lorne now. He does, I and mean, it's like it's pretty unreasonable. Like he's like that bitch. Yeah, he's upset. She's gonna get it. It's so out of character. All right, so I never thought about this before, having read the book many a time. If people are being controlled by Opon also, not just manipulated. events, manipulated, if you will, was, you know, uh, Perrin uh, Randy for Tattersail, or was it Opon, you know? Perrin's been isolated, too. He has, has not had a lot of friends. He hasn't had a lot of company. He probably hasn't been in the company of women much. So, I mean, it's probably a little from column A, a little from column B, right? Sure. Didn't take much so for a one, to put them in the same room and then let you know things happen that so were going to happen. I, column A being the male version of Opon, and column B being the female version of Opon. That is dirty, <laughs> dirty, incestuous. Oh, that whole coin thing is Stop crazy. Stop it! Stop it! <laughs> um, do you? I mean, I'm serious about this. About the, uh, parent being out of character here do you guys think that he's acting rationally and normally like well, do you think he's making good decisions right now tattersale didn't make good decisions leaving i know all but crap behind i mean but again, we're, is he being controlled that's kind of what i'm asking uh-huh. like do you think that he's at the wheel right now is he at the helm i don't know i could easily just say it's guilt or some sort of pain that he's going through right now it seems like a great overreaction if we can go back to an earlier instance where Perrin is not being controlled, not being manipulated, or maybe he's being manipulated a little bit, or he actually wants to do it, then this could be the same situation. Here he's being manipulated, and at the same time, this is a real reaction that he's feeling at the same time also. Okay, I'm going to read you a, uh, a mental quote from Perrin, and All then right. you tell me how, how you take it. Okay? All right. He thinks to himself, all that come close to me, all that I care for, Tattersail, he whispered, and fell to his knees. That's all that he cares for. That's all, all his guilt. Yeah. What What are you talking about? What has been taken from him? Hmm. What has been? Nothing. Nothing has been taken from him. He has been given command of the bridge burners for duties rendered, right? Except that's all. I mean, he got stabbed to death. They're not around anymore. They're going to be taken from him by Lorne. Did he care about those? Like, it says all that he cared about has been taken from him. What about his and family? Well, he left them. He joined the military. <sighs> I don't know what to say, dude. Who? All right, so who's thinking this for him? I don't know, but it seems out of character to me. Okay, it it does. I, I I agree with Etienne a little bit. That that seemed completely out of place and not true. He's kind of been in like self social isolation for three years, right? Yeah, yeah. But isn't that like some of the things that you give up to get to the point where you are? I mean, well, that would be a thing you lose. That's fine, but then he's blaming Lauren for something that he did, right? He's not taking responsibility when he met. Uh, talk he was like oh this is a person i can really get to like i haven't had one of those type of people in a long time i assume it's partially because he's joined the military <laughs> no I, I i don't think because he joined the military i think because he's been on this lorn mission for for so long he's Three not years. allowed to get close to anybody and right he did mention that how he hasn't been close to anybody in a very long time yeah but Picking through guts. Okay, so here's another thing that he says that's crazy. She never took the easy path in anything, referring to Tattersail. Lauren's taken her from me just like she's taken everything else. He does not know Tattersail well enough to make that statement. All right, so the only person that we know that does, what was her boyfriend's name? Callet. Yeah, I just just feel like this is, we're not intended to take this as Perrin. Like being logical or reasonable, like this is crazy. This is crazy, Perrin. All right, well, put who's this being in manipulated? The, uh, put this in our back pocket. I fine. think so. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, I, mean, so, I don't disagree with you. I'm just giving you anything I could possibly come up with to to argue it. I understand. I understand. So, do you guys think that it's possible that Tattersail's death was the price, the exchange that was made in order for Perrin to continue living? Remember Hood's deal? 
Well, without going too too many books ahead, don't go yeah, any I books do. ahead. <laughs> I do remember when they were discussing it. Somebody else had to die to keep the balance correct, right? Got to balance the books, man. Somebody's got to pass through Hood's gate in his stead. If he's not going to go in, somebody in his shadow is going to go through the gate. And I had speculated maybe his dad because we had heard recently that his dad was sick, but. I well, don't know if we ever hear any more about his dad. So. Well, it's not Tattersale, right? Because she's... Because he's right she's now what? it is. I mean, she's dead. Boom. Fair enough. Well, Blurden is dead, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, he certainly looks dead. <laughs> they both look dead, though. Fair you enough. Know, Fair enough. going off appearances. There's just Bellardin's hand is left. Like, a little <laughs> yeah. bit of hand is left. Like, yeah. he was reaching for something. They They died in an embrace. Yeah, she gave a big hug. And his hand was outstretched, like he was what reaching for something. I don't know. Yeah, past Saturn like sale, maybe. Yeah, yeah interesting. Yeah. It is. I don't know the answer. Um, it is weird though. Okay, next part. You mean time to move on, right, Philip? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. No, I agree. What do you want to talk about? Well, there were there were two parts. There there were two things I did want to mention. One was when Talk looked to the southeast, or sorry, northeast, and he got that painful itch. Above his scar, remember yeah, that? Or beneath his scar? Mm-hmm. And you had mentioned that you thought that now the loss of the eye gives him some supernatural insight into stuff? Well, that was what the... Hmm, the Moranth? No, no, the Seven Cities people had told him. That the yeah. loss of an eye granted inner sight. So you did convince me that he, whatever his... Whenever his eye itches or hurts or twitches... He's having some sort of like psychic flash on an issue. It doesn't specify, but it, you know, it's like one of those things where you hear the spinning of the coin. Well, when his eye yeah. itches, something's up. Right. So something to pay attention to. And he's looking off to the northeast, which is the direction that the little bony creature fled in. Oh, it did? It fled to the northeast, and he's looking in that direction when Perrin's like freaking out. And he's like, should I have come with this guy? This seemed like might have been a bad idea. Too late. Here we are. And it's, then they, <laughs> they ride off together. Yeah. So what? It, I just want to revisit that, that, that little quirk about Tox's character. Is it, He's so cavalier. So as darkness engulfs the Rivy Plain, Crone investigates a flare of unusual magic. It is nighttime, and Crone, like you said, is over the Rivy Plain. And she calls out to her ravens she's a great raven are they great ravens also yeah 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 so she 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 calls out to other great ravens so she can get some information on what's been going on here because this is the place where tattersail and bellardin blew up it is roughly speaking yeah the brood had told her to check it out down in the south keep your eyes open for stuff going on on the plane and as she was flying around, this is two days have passed, by the way. Yes. Oh, you're right. Yeah. Two she, days she left have passed. brood two days ago and she's flown all the way down here, really pretty close to Jerusalem at this point, at least the lake. And she's seeing these flares in her v- magic flaring. And she's like, what is that? What kind of magic is that? It's unrecognizable to her. Right. And it's actually, well, we find out because when she does t- talk to the Ravens, we find out that the little puppet Herlock is back and he's on the trail of Lorne. And as a raven gets near him, he'll blast it out of the sky, get back in his warren, and then come out and do it again at another place. Yeah. Yeah, he's popping in and out of his warren and killing great ravens. And they are not used to being able to be hurt by magic. To them, it's like it's ambrosia, remember? Oh, that's right. But he's using chaos magic, so that must be one of the reasons, right? That's what Crone is trying to figure out. She sends all of her ravens away. She's like, why have you even dawdled this long? And they're like, we wanted to know where he was going. That He's heading south. And I'm like, all right, good out of here. So they all leave. And then she she puts on all of her wards, and she protects herself. And then she dive bombs Hairlock when he pops out of his warren. And he hits her with a hell of a blast of chaos magic. And it, it does not feel good, let's just say. She completely underestimated his power. Uh, she gets out of it. She gets away from him. And she's like, oh, oh, an ancient Warren. No wonder. Yeah, she says it was an eldering taste. It had an eldering taste about it. And then she says soul shifting was no simple cantrip. So she's talking about 
the uh, that he's a puppet now, right? Yeah. And I just felt like that aspect of um uh I don't know, that was just something that stuck out in my mind when she was talking about that part. Well, when she was talking to she was talking to a male great raven named Hurdle who had said, "I think there's a soul shifting going on down there." Oh, that's what it was, yeah. And they have a little conversation. Well, she's thinking basically that like it was never popular because they go crazy. And maybe this puppet's been around since the time when this was known magic. And she dismisses that thought. It's like, there's no way he would have died by now. They're insane. So it's just reinforcement of the idea that nobody really can withstand this transformation for long. It makes them crazy and who knows, destroys them utterly eventually. I don't know. But Crone decides that she needs to tell Anamanda Rake about this. And this is, goes contrary to Brood's instructions to keep Anamanda Rake in the dark about everything. She's going to tell him about this anyway because, because Rake is good at killing things. And we know how he kills things. With that sword of his. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. All right, so Crone decides to go off and tell Anamanda Rake, and she flies away, and she doesn't notice. Did not notice the dead smudge on the land below her, nor the woman camped in its center. There was no magic there to speak of in any case. Oh, she's talking about Tool, right? Oh, that might be. Yeah, she's talking about Tool and Lorne. What dead? What's this dead smudge? Well, Talani Mass is the dead. He's creating essentially a dead magic zone. Could it not be the thing that was born on the plane? No, because there's there's a dead well, smudge and a woman running. sleeping in it. It has fled, but I mean, how far has it gone? Yeah, the small bony creature didn't have a camp. Why would it be a dead smudge though? It's once it's either Talani Mass creating that dead magic zone, or it's the effect of the auditorial sword. I think it's uh, the Talana Moss's magic. I th I think so too. I th I think that's I think that's more like called a circle of protection or something. But like no, that. it says it right there. There was no magic there to speak of in any case. Uh, yeah. yeah, but his power is to deaden magic. Sure enough. So it's an, it's an absence sword. or a void of magic. Yeah, exactly. I think that's a good call, Philip. I think it's a good call. So my epiphany uh, in this section was after Crone was attacked, and she said, "What a price to pay for knowledge." But she said, Elder Warren, indeed, the eldest of them all, who plays with I, chaos, right? Yeah. And that goes right back to what Tool was saying earlier when he said, Starvol Demolane, the oldest Warren of them all. We know the chaos Warren is by name. It's Kerald Gallane, and it's Anamander Rake's Warren. That's fine. But I think there's some a little bit of overlap here. Because remember she said that she there were three Elder Warrens. And he said, no, there were many. And he said, all born of one, Starvold Demolane. So Starvold Demolane is the eldest of them all, right? I don't know that to be true. Well, I don't if they know all that came he from knows. One. Why, why do you assume that he knows everything? I don't assume anybody knows everything. Well, you're assuming that he's correct. When we know which Warren Hairlock has been using. He's been using Chaos, right? He's been using, yeah, Chaos, which is called Corald Galane, not Starvold Demolane. Just saying. Crone says it's the eldest ever, and Tool calls Starvold Demolane the oldest ever. Okay. Just saying, there's a connection. Remember, Tattersail was on the trail of Hairlock, right? Was she? I thought so. I thought she was trying to get around Lorne so that she could beat her to Whiskey Jack. So, oh, Hairlock was following them. That's right. Hairlock is following Lorne. Yeah. And... and he's heading south, which means that on the map, they've made it around the bend of the lake, and they're now heading south towards Darugisan. Okay. And the okay. Hills. But the point is, they were. He was supposed to be following Lorne and Tool, and essentially, essentially, so was. So was Tattersail, more or less mimicking the same path, right? I think so, yeah. They're kind of all converging on Darugistan. It's possible that whatever created that pillar was, in fact, Hairlock. Why would you think that? One, he's in the vicinity. Two, he's using an Elder Warren. And three, there's life transfer involved. That's true. All of those things seem to be true as far as I can tell. But Corald Galane was not among the Warrens that were used. I don't think it was Hairlock. 
I don't know. It doesn't taste like hair lock. You know what I mean? I do know what you mean. I'm still though I have two theories now, but either one could be right. So <laughs> one was it's cruel somehow, and the other is well, I guess Opan, and then the third one is it could be Hairlock, right? I think Kroll is still my favorite, as that stuff goes. Well anyway, good catch on that thing about Lorne camping on the plane down below. I was I was confused by that. Adjunct Lorne is gifted with a lesson. So apparently Lorne and Tool are camping on the plane and she's thinking about stuff. So they have witnessed uh, these puffs of magic lighting up the sky and she asks Tool if they're related to what happened two nights ago. Oh, he says, importantly, this is sorcery and it's inside my sphere of influence. And she's like, I'm not concerned by magic. And she's like, I let me sleep. And she goes to sleep. That distinction, I thought that the pillar of fire was referred to as a sorcery, but Tool doesn't think that was sorcery. He thinks that was something else. But this, what was going on, what Hairlock is doing out on the plane, that's sorcery. So, huh, question mark, question mark, question mark. All right, fair enough. Nevertheless, um, she goes to sleep, and then Tool just stands there all night long. And then as dawn is approaching, he moves just a little tiny bit. <laughs> and then he goes back to being still. And then she wakes up. Lauren's kind of like, Ooh, yawns. and To the tip of a sword at her throat. <laughs> and Tool's fl- holding it. It's a flint sword. Yeah, it's right over her throat. And it's not moving. Mm-mm. Just perfectly still. Just hanging over her. Well, before she had gone to bed, he had expressed his concern. Right. And that said, this was this was something to be worried about. And then when she wakes up, he says, Ravens don't fly at night. Ravens were being attacked within my sphere of influence last night in the dark. If they found us, whoever this is, they could have appeared right next to us. Yeah, he, he gives her a warning and she ignores it. This is the lesson that just because they're pretty good at what they do, somebody could have gotten past him and killed her with a mundane weapon. It didn't have to be magic. And she says, like, thank you for pointing out my growing complacency. There's not a lot more to this other than some humor at the end, I guess. Uh, yeah, actually, uh, talking about the Talana Moss, Lorne asks Tool, what does he think about? And what does he say? He says, futility. And then she says, what do your kind think about? And he says, they don't think at all. She says, well, why is that? And he says, because it's futile. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. That is some comedy, but I think that is a real telling um, look into how a Talana mass is. You know, they, they just, they're kind of like around. You know, when you're around for so long, you kind of have a... You know, everything's glacial. It moves glacially. And I kind of think that's how he's kind of expressing that. It sets him apart as well because he's not like the rest of the Talana Mas. It's it's like he's been awakened mentally, right? I really I really like this interaction because remember she said he he's she's never heard of another Talani Mas ever speak. And she did mention that he's speaking more and more and more as in often as he's getting re in touch with his. I don't know if humanity is the right word, but. Maybe his former self? Yeah. Is it Artelanimas? Are they former? Do they have former selves? She thinks so. She had, she, uh, I think it's in this section. She has a mental conversation with herself about how she had just considered the Talanamas to be undead, soulless creatures. But the more she engages with, with Tool, the more she has doubts about that. Mm-hmm. Because he obviously has a personality. He has a sense of humor. Yeah. He tells her jokes. Um, this isn't the first time either. He gives her lessons. And he's, he's relatively speaking, he's gentle, right, with her. But um, he, he reveals a lot of very, very good information. Uh, he's just like a font of historical details and facts and stuff that people would kill to know. This guy is just like, yeah, that's no stone. That was a thing. It happened. He, in this section, mentions the three 
um, founding races, the Jagat, the Talanamas, and the Fork Cruel Assail. Yeah. And we've heard, we've heard about the Fork Cruel Assail, I think, one more time before now. And we're starting to get a little bit more of the Amas, uh, mostly through him. And then we're getting a little bit about the Jagat, and that's coming from him. But, I mean... It's just trickles, right? Little bits here and there. And it's like such a pleasure to get these details and these facts. Agreed. All right. So that ends chapter 10. That ends book three called The Mission. And that puts us over the halfway point in this novel. So congratulations to us, right? Congratulations to you reading at home. It has been it has been a ride. All right, so let's see. Uh, general discussion time. Do you guys have anything you guys want to talk about? God, this book, every time I look at it as we're reading it, it just seems longer than I ever remembered. <laughs> well, we are reading it slowly. That's true. I mean, yeah, usually when you're reading, you're like, I can get 10 pages, 20 pages done a day. But yeah, now we're yeah. taking these 20 pages and then I'm rereading these 20 pages and then I well, listen to audio. Yeah. We're lis- we're reading one chapter every two to three weeks. Yeah. So slowly. That's true. You know, and, and it really does take, for all of our listeners, it really does take that level of effort to, to I wouldn't say master, but to explore. Prepare. Prepare, yes. I mean, I honestly, I mean, I could do it a little bit faster but not much. I could do it a little bit better, but not much. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's, um, let's talk about this chapter. Just uh, kind of a high level overview of this chapter. All right. Um, what do you, how do you guys feel? Like, what was the purpose of this chapter? What did you learn in this chapter that was kind of revelatory or what did it illustrate to you that you didn't already know about? lots of world building details but of course i love that kind of thing but you oh, yeah. mentioned what you get out of it well i got lots of things but i asked you first so you well i don't want to i don't want to say what you said because you told me <laughs> you're talking about the convergence yes okay uh, well is there anything else though is there anything else what we saw we saw the jagged being related to the giants that are still around the jagged are no longer they're gone right as far as we know, there's Except no Jagger one. left who's buried and imprisoned. Right. Well, there's a couple of things. Yeah, there's a lot of details. I think there was a lot of character building on some. We had the introduction of Caliban and Brood, finally. Finally. Yeah, it's been a while. We've heard about him since the very early days. I mean, yeah, exactly. That's been an, an entire part of the story that's been completely, or just barely referenced, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so you, now you finally meet that guy and and find out what's what's going on in his head. So... And then you learn a little bit more about Crone. Point is, I think it's, yeah, character building. There we go. That's what I got out of it. And details. I think you're right 100% on Crone being like just a master spy. (laughs) Double agent. Hey, everybody's a double agent in this one. That's crazy. Okay, so we we talked a little bit about how it's kind of like this game of uh, chase. You've got Lorne, who left at the end of last chapter, and she's apparently not in a hurry. She's on a timetable, but it's not like be there now. It's, you know, I don't know what it is. But she's on her way to Darujistan, I think. And then Hairlock is tracking her down real close, real close. Tattersail's following, but trying to get around her, also going to Darujistan. And then Bellardin's out there because he's trying to bury Nightchill. So he's just an innocent bystander who gets murdered, right? Which makes another thing I, I did want to mention, I'm glad you brought that up, is that Erickson will introduce these characters, and some of them are really cool, and some of them are just offhanded, but, I mean, people die almost whimsically, right? Yeah. I mean, Tattersail is a kind of major character. Yeah. She's gone. She just died. But, come on, Callet, Nightchill, uh, Blurden, doesn't really matter. Yeah. You're meeting all these people... And and it's liking they die. them, liking them, you know, he's taking the time to to build them in our minds, you know, like create them as actual people as opposed to you know puppets. Not that Hairlock's not a real character. Yeah, but. well, and not just yeah, and there's another one, Hairlock, but not just 
talk, not just giving them a name and introducing them and whatever. He gives them their histories and what they've done and how they've interact with people. And, yeah. and then they die. Yeah. And we know a lot about Tattersale at this point, way more than Perrin, right? God, it's such a baby at the end there. Like, oh, I'm going to get revenge. I agree. Yeah. That was so not his character. So, so, uh, so the, I did not like the flavor of that section, but I, I just feel like that was Opon and not, not him. Okay. So like what, what I think all this is getting to is that this was an, a kind of like an example of what a convergence is. Like we were warned chapters, two chapters ago, I think that a gathering of ascendants is a fell thing. And then a gathering of wizards is a fell thing. And we've got both right now gathering like everybody's heading to Darujistan and Amanda Rake is there um Opon is there already we've got Shadow Throne uh, I guess he's on his way there I, I don't really do we know where Shadow Throne is no we've heard nothing for a long time that's true the last thing they did was they decided they were gonna follow Perrin around well there was the hound was the closest yeah introduction yeah. Nevertheless, all of these people are converging on Darujistan right now. And I think that's what this was about. I think that this is like a physical example of what it means when they say power attracts power. Like, it's doing it. It's doing it. We're watching it happen. And we're not even watching the most powerful people. We're watching fairly powerful people, right? A high wizardess, you know, a high sorceress, whatever. Um, the adjunct to the empress, like... Those are the types of people we're watching. We don't get to see Shadow Throne and Opon and it's kind of nerve wracking, I think. Like it is a fell thing. And they're they're all going to Drew <laughs> that city's doomed. <laughs> it's doomed, man. Whew. All right, well let's wrap it up then. Let's uh, let's say goodbye and I guess thanks for joining us. Um, that's it for this episode and this chapter. We'll get back to reading. You do the same. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you in the next one.